In this class we're going to look at um, profit maximization. We're going to look at one theory of the firm, one theory of the behaviour of the firm. Um, companies may, may set different objectives depending on the personalities of the owners or the conditions in which they find themselves operating. The most extreme form of behaviour is to set this objective of profit maximization, which is our starting point in economics. Now, we recognize that the vast majority of companies do not profit maximize. In fact, it's unlikely any companies would profit maximize. There are different objectives that companies may set. They may set um, a profit goal or a percentage return on the capital or um, they may set some um, objective for the growth of sales or the, the level of sales in the market. So profit maximization is not one that normally jumps to mind but in economics it's the starting point. This is the most efficient model, this is the most extreme model we've got and we start from here and then gradually we relax the assumptions and we can talk about other forms of uh, business objectives. So let's start with profit maximization, um, the extreme view. Now this is what's known as the neoclassical model of the firm. Neoclassical economics is what is studied at most colleges and universities. And this is the neoclassical model of the firm. It's the very extreme model. It's unlikely it will ever be encountered in real life. So we use it as a model. It, it's the starting point. It's the point of reference. It's a, it's a theory and we can measure all the other models against it so that's why we use it. It's a theoretical firm it doesn't have to correspond to any actual firm it's it's our thinking about the extreme form of behavior extreme efficiency and lots of strange assumptions which we'll come across in a few seconds um, which limit the applicability of this to real-life examples. We, we can't find real-life examples to be perfectly honest. Um, most companies are too complex and they don't set this as an objective. So the model is unlikely to apply in practice since managers um, don't have the information or indeed the motivation to profit maximize. It's an extreme model extreme efficiency and therefore unlikely to be applied in practice. It assumes no uncertainty regarding market prices or internal processes within the firm. Everything is known, everything is certain in this model. So it's it's based on fairly extreme assumptions. We also say it's a static model it's not complicated by time, it doesn't change over time it's a static model, it's a, it's a picture of the company at an instant in time this theoretical company that we're, we're talking about and finally we say it's a rational model rational means maximizing it's extreme efficiency as I've been saying and it's based on a mathematical view of the firm which is uh, very very strict in its in its uh, application and in the, its methodology very very strict model so again very unlikely that we would encounter it it's based on what we call marginal calculations to decide the optimum or most profitable level of output marginal is what economics uses neoclassical economics uses all the time we talk about marginal costs marginal revenue marginal utility we have we have this concept of marginal marginal simply means the if it's marginal cost it's the cost of the last unit if it's marginal revenue it's the revenue received from selling the last unit so it's 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 the revenue from the last unit sold or if we're talking about marginal cost it's the cost of making the last unit that was sold We'll come across this concept again shortly. Um, it's also worth noting that it, this is one model of the firm. There are many 
models available. As I said t uh, to you a few moments ago, it's it's the case that in economics there are models talking about sales maximization, growth of sales maximization, growth of the firm, uh, return on capital, and this one's called satisficing, which people just make enough money and they're quite happy, the company's running, they're reinvesting, they're happy, they're not maximizing anything. So there are many different models of the firm. This is the, the strict one at the start and it's important that we understand this one so we can talk about it, criticize it and use it as a, a standard for comparison for other firms and other models. So let's, uh, let's start. Let's start with the diagram. Here we have marginal cost, marginal revenue. Now, the shape of the marginal cost and the marginal revenue is explained elsewhere. So we'll just take them as that. If we produce one unit of output, the cost of producing that one unit is more than the revenue we'd get from selling that unit. So the little red, it's almost a rectangle, the little red shaded area is the loss associated if we produce one unit of output. Just one unit, the costs, the marginal cost, the cost is higher than the revenue, the amount we get from selling it. Therefore there's a loss on that unit. Now if we do that for several units, you can see the little red rectangles becoming less. But there will also be a point, I'll put the cursor onto the uh, slide, just a moment, there you go. Uh, <clears throat> there's also a point here where the, the cost of making the unit is exactly equal to what we receive from that unit. So we break even on that unit there, just that unit. We have a loss on the one before it, a loss on the one before that, a loss on the one before that, and so on. So this area in here is our accumulated losses. That area there is the accumulated losses. We break even at this point. Okay. Now if you go further than that point, put the cursor back on the screen, if you go further than that point, we would make a profit. There's a profit on the next unit. Of course, there's a loss on all of these units in here, which we need to redeem. But over here we've made a profit on the next one. A profit on the next one. Oops, sorry. Um, a profit on the next one, a profit on the next one, a profit on the next one, and so on. So we're making a profit on each one of these and we break even at this point over here. So we break even over here. But we've made profit on all the previous ones but of course we have to allow for the losses at the early stage. So a different way of looking at this is using totals. Here's the the total cost curve. That's believed to be the, the typical shape. Here's our total revenue curve and you can see we have a break even here. We have negative profits here, so we draw this one as profits, negative profits, i.e. losses. And then we go into profit. Profit is the this area up here. Here we've got profit and down here we break even. We break even there. So this diagram one we talked about earlier is reflected in this one down here. Now if we go to the to the firm in total, this is what we would expect to see. We have average cost, marginal cost, average revenue, and marginal revenue. Now we need to consider these points. The first point is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. On that point, point A, there is a break even on that unit. It's marginal. There is a break even on that unit. 
Over here, we've got average revenue, average cost are equal, so the firm breaks even there, so the profits for the firm, for the company, is equal there. So the profit is equal to zero there. It's it's, it's a break even. Down here, point C, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, is a point of profit maximization. And the point D is the point in which the company breaks even again. So there are two break evens for the company, B and D. This one is profit maximization and this one is loss maximization. So that's really what we determined earlier. When we go back here, when marginal revenue equals marginal cost, that's a break-even point. But we have the accumulated profits up to there, so that must be the point of profit maximization. If we produced one more unit, the cost here would exceed the revenue. So that is the point of profit maximization. So we have profit maximization where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. As a matter of interest, go back here again, we have two break-evens. We have this one here, where there was a break-even. At this point, on that unit, revenue equals cost on that unit. And we have losses up here. So that's also the point of loss maximization. We never talk about that, oddly enough, in economics, because it's not something we set out to do. We never set out to maximize losses. And this one over here, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, the same, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So at this point over here, it's profit maximization. So that's the point that we are discussing in this session. That's the point of profit maximization. Now let's have a look at it um, again. Well, in this diagram, we've got at the point of profit maximization, we have total revenue, which is OCGE. There's the, the average revenue curve, so if we take this point up, take it across, that rectangle, it's this amount here by this amount here, that's the, the total revenue. The total cost is OCHF because that's read off the average cost curve. The point H is on the average cost curve, so that's the point there, which is total cost. Now if you subtract the small rectangle here from the big rectangle, we're left with H, G, E, F. And that's the point of, sorry, that's the, the level of profit associated with profit maximizing output, C. So that's the amount of profit. And there's our account showing how it's worked out. We could do this in a table, and we can do that to illustrate the point just using ordinary figures. There, there's the table. We've got output, marginal cost, marginal revenue, marginal profit. It's the change in profit as output changes, and total profit. So, if, if this is the marginal cost, that's the marginal revenue, subtract one from the other, we get marginal profit. Revenue is 20, cost is 5, profit is 15, total profit is 15. Here, marginal cost has gone up, marginal revenue has gone down, 18 minus 7 is 11, add the 11 to the 15, because we've made 15 profit before on the first one, we've made 11 on the second one, so our total profit is now 26. On the third unit it's 10, 16, so the marginal profit is 6, 16 minus 10. Take away from the revenue, take away the cost from the revenue, left at 6. We already have 26 profit, so 26 and 6 is 32. The next one is 14 and 14, so there's no profit on this one, it's break even. So we add 0 to 32, which is just 32. The next one is 19 and 12, so the revenue is only 12, the cost is 19, we lose 7, and the total profit is starting to fall. So with figures, we can see how it works out. 
it's the same sort of logic. If we draw that on a diagram it would look like that. We've got 14 and 4. 14 and 4. So the marginal cost, marginal revenue is 14, 4 units of output. 14, marginal cost, marginal revenue 14, 4 units of output. So note, well, the selling price of the product must exceed the average variable cost. The average variable cost is the amount of raw materials, energy, uh, labour, all that goes to make the product. Well, the price must exceed that. If it's if it's costing um, more than the raw materials and the labour to make something, don't make it. Um, if it's not the case, then the organisation's in, uh, interest it's in the organisation's interest to cease production Im immediately. So, if raw materials, labour, energy cost, let's say, five pounds, and you can sell it for three pounds, it's best not to make it because every unit you're making, you're losing two, which is a bit silly. And there's uh, another sort of calculated example. If it costs five pounds to make a product and it can be sold for four, then each unit produced will incur a loss to the firm, and therefore the firm should cease production to avoid the loss. Therefore, the selling price of the product must exceed the average variable cost of production. It must do. Second note: when the selling price is less than the average total cost but greater than the average variable cost, then the firm should continue to produce since it's receiving a contribution towards its fixed costs. Well, if the firm is producing a good, I'm sorry, a good, uh, and it's costing, let's say, four pounds to make it, and it can sell it for five pounds, but still not covering all its costs in the firm, the costs of its premises, of its machinery and so on, all the fixed costs, but it's making a pound profit on each one, that it's still worthwhile to continue to produce because at least there's a pound profit on the unit that's going towards the fixed costs. So as long as the average variable costs are covered, it's worthwhile continuing to produce. So the average total cost is equal to the average variable cost plus the fixed cost. Average total cost, ATC, is equal to average variable cost, AVC, plus average fixed cost, AFC. Now, if the average total cost is 10, the average variable cost is 7, the average fixed cost is equal to 3, and the price is 18. Now, if that's the case, then each unit sold will cover the average variable cost, uh, 7, and pay £1 towards the fixed cost. So here's the, the cost of the raw materials, labour, energy and so on, the, the variable cost, 7. You can sell it for 8, so you make £1 towards the fixed cost. The eight pound is still not covering the average total cost, but at least there's making a pound which is making a contribution towards the average fixed cost. The alternative would be to close the company down and then the people are stuck with the assets, with the machines, the buildings and so on, which they have to sell off, maybe sell off at a premium, at a reduced price. Uh, which will be uh, perhaps an enormous loss to the company. If the firm did close down, it would not be receiving the contribution and it would lose the three pounds on every unit. So now, why do firms profit maximise or why should we discuss the, the model if they don't profit maximise? Well, if an entrepreneur is on his or her own, um, then the, there's a chance that the firm will profit maximise. 
because the entrepreneur is right on top of the situation and will understand all the costs and the revenues and, and will perhaps work towards some sort of rational solution to the output problem. We'll try to perhaps maximize. Uh, if the profit varies with the amount of entrepreneurial effort expended, the effort has a negative utility, then the entrepreneur must find an optimal trade-off between effort and profit. So the danger here is, what this means is that entrepreneurs, if they are single owners of the business, they may work too hard, have a negative utility, a negative pleasure, a negative effect on them, perhaps their health, their overworking. So even though the entrepreneur knows about profit maximization and knows how to do it, it may not be worthwhile doing it because it'll affect his or her health, it'll affect uh, their performance, long-run performance in the market, in the business. Um, so there's a trade-off to be had between the effort that people put in to profit maximize and the benefits of profit maximizing. But there again, profit maximization may be forced on the entrepreneur by competitive pressure by other companies. But it may not be uh, a good long-run solution. Now let's look at the criticisms of the profit maximizing model. Um, why profit maximize in non-competitive markets? Sorry, that's uh, non-competitive markets. Um, the, prepar the separation of ownership from control means that managers could steer the firm away from profit maximization and pursue their own objectives. I mean, in most companies, we have the owners and we have the managers. The owners want profit and want a, a return on their investment. The managers want a nice lifestyle. They want perks in the job. They want nice offices, good holidays, good salaries, different set of objectives. So there's a, a battle, a continuous battle between the owners and the managers. And if the managers are very strong in a particular company because of their expertise, perhaps, then they could steer the company away from profit maximization. Um, some studies suggested that businessmen do not use marginal rules. They don't use marginal cost and marginal revenue, um, mostly because of uncertainty. So they use what we call rules of thumb rather than uh, marginalist techniques and setting prices. They, they, they look at the market, they think what the market will take, they set a price accordingly. If it's if they're selling well, they might increase the price slightly. If they're not selling, they might reduce the price. It's not necessarily done on marginal calculations. So that's an overview of this very important model of profit maximization. It's um, it's not very realistic in terms of the fact that we, we can't observe it readily in, in the real world. But as a model, it's very important because it's a starting point for us to consider other models which become progressively more realistic. And we're moving away from this super efficiency model towards perhaps ideas of the organization which are based on people and people's motivations and and other qualities, not necessarily the strict uh, in economic interpretation that this model gives us. So plenty to think about in this particular session. Um, thanks for watching.